I want y'all to open your Bible with me this morning. We need to look first in John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, there is a verse that is actually the conclusion of the Gospel of John. There's one more chapter, and that's kind of an appendix. There's an extra story that John just has to tell. But this is the culmination of his gospel. This is where he's been going all along. And I want us to have that target in mind. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. The Gospel of John's got a number of signs. They're miraculous things that God does. But they're not just miracles. They're, they're things that are pointing. They're saying, here's something about Jesus you should know. And all the time, while they're showing different things he wants to do for all of mankind, they're all declaring one thing. He's God come in the flesh. He's absolutely our creator who's come to redeem us and make us children of God. John goes on in verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The whole point of writing the Gospel of John, the whole point of the Holy Spirit keeping it for us, the whole point of us looking at it today together is that we would believe him, that we would know who he is, and that by having Jesus, we get life from God, that we live in him. That's the whole reason for what we're doing. That's the point of today, being in this room together and singing these songs and opening Scripture and remembering His blood and His body and, and praying to Him is so that we would know who Jesus is and get life from Him and live because of Him. If you'd go back with me to chapter 1, I had just had a... I just wanted you to know where the, where the end of the road's going. That's where we're heading. That's where the gospel of John is all about. And in chapter 1, he's told us that this Jesus he's talking about, that he's showing us his signs and we're hearing his teaching, that he was before the beginning and that he made everything that's around us and nothing was made without him, that he came bringing life and light his own people rejected him, but those who received him, he gave them the power to become children of God. Now we switch from who he is to what his disciples are supposed to be about. And it starts in the Gospel of John in verse 29 as, excuse me, I've got to back up a little bit, verse 19, where, where they're questioning John, the baptizer. He's come before Jesus. He's come to, he's not the light. It's already said. He came to bear witness to the light. He's pointing at Jesus. And some uh, Jewish leaders from Jerusalem show up. The priests have sent them. They're going to ask John who he is. And they ask him and listen to the words in verse 20. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. His confession is that he is not the chosen one of God. He is not the Savior that was promised through Abraham and promised through its son of David. A Messiah that's coming. He's not it. He goes on and they say, well, are, are you uh, Elijah? No, I'm not. Are you the prophet? No. Finally, he said, they said, who are you? Give us an answer. We've got to go back and, and tell the people that sent us who you are. 
Give us an answer to that. And so he replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. The prophets knew that that the hill country around Jerusalem was a bunch of winding trails over the hills, down in the valleys, up on the next hill, around that point, uh, bypassing that that cliff and, and going around. But what we really need is a flat, straight road for God's people to come to God. There's too many turns, there's too many twists, and so a lot of work needs to be done, pulling down the hilltops and filling in the gullies and straightening out the path. And really what they're talking about is not a, not a road at all, it's our hearts. There's a lot of turns and twists in our lives and in our hearts. And coming to God requires a direct path. And we're going to have to tear down some hills and we're going to have to put some culverts in and, and build, some, uh, build up some of the road and make it smooth to come to God. He's talking about repentance. There's a lot of things we need to turn from to be ready for God. And John says, my job is to call people to prepare for God to come into their life. That's my job. They ask him, then why do you baptize? He says, well, I baptize with water, verse um, 26. But among you stands one you don't know. That's interesting. He came to that which is his own. His own did not receive him. They didn't know him. You would think the priest and the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem would recognize God just like that when he comes, but they don't. They don't know him. He's one you don't know. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. I'm not him, John says. I'm so far below him. I'm not even worthy to be his slave that carries his sandals around and and puts them on his feet and takes them off his feet. I'm not even the the servant who would, would remove the sandals at the door and wash the feet as they're coming in. I'm beneath that. This is John The one who is preparing the way for the Son of God. And John says, I'm beneath him. Here's the practical thing for us today. I'm about, well, I don't think I can reach high enough to show you how put out I am with the thought of celebrity preachers. You get a mega church... You get enough advertisement, you get enough appearances on The Tonight Show, and suddenly you're a rock star. John refuses to let anyone look at him. Even something Jesus applies to him, he won't apply to himself. Because Christians... Church is not about rock star preachers. Church is not even about church. It's not about you and me. It's about Jesus. You're scared of talking to people about church, about religion, about serving God? A lot of times it's because we're such a horrible example of a follower of Jesus when we look at ourselves. But it's not about us. We're not pointing at us. We're pointing at Him. He's the Son of God. I... I can't even give good advice on most things. I have to find people to help me. I'm constantly looking for people that know more about what I'm doing than I do. But I know where to find life. 
It's not from me, it's in him. John is pointing at Jesus. And when they're asking, are you the prophet? He actually does come in the spirit of Elijah. But he won't even let him say he's Elijah because he's too busy pointing at Jesus. Look what he does. Verse 29. We get several days here. There's a day when the Jews come and they want to talk and ask John who he is. And in verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, I I think he's got a finger out. Out of the crowd. That one right there. Look at him. Look. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jews understood a Passover lamb. A Passover lamb who died and its blood was painted on the house. And your oldest child got to live that night because the wrath of God was averted from that house. Jews continued eating that lamb, killing it, painting blood, eating the lamb, eating it, eating it, generation after generation, telling the story, reminding them of lamb that saved them Not just their oldest child, but saved the whole family from slavery in Egypt. They also remembered carrying an animal, leading an animal, holding a leash, going all the way to Jerusalem to get to a priest to say, this is my sacrifice, and lambs are sacrificed. Offer to God. Well, this is a lamb of God. A lamb not unlike the one that Abraham found in a thicket when he's about to kill his son Isaac. And God says, no, let that one die. And the animal is killed. Now we have the Lamb of God. The John that writes this gospel talks about a lamb later. Y'all remember Revelation 5? He's all sad because they can't open the book. It's sealed up with seven seals, completely, perfectly locked down. Can't read the inside or the outside. He didn't know what's going to happen. And he's weeping and, and, and someone says, hey, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome and, and he can open the seals. He's worthy to open them. And John looks and does he see a lion? No, 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 no. He's told, see the lion, and he he turns to see the lion, and what does he see? A slain lamb. A lamb that's died and shed its blood. It's Jesus. He's my lamb. He's your lamb. He's our sacrifice. He's the lion that protects us and stands over us roaring, declaring, these are mine. That lamb, it's the lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. Don't look at me. Don't ask your friends to look at you. Ask your friends to hear and see and know Jesus who takes away all of our sins. John goes on and says, This man comes before me and has surpassed me because he was before me. He comes after me, but he was before me. He's always been. Look down in verse 33. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water. He's the one who told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Here's a, here's a huge difference. I can put someone down in water. I can baptize someone in water. You can baptize someone in water. Now we believe because of what Romans 6 says, that they're dying to sin and they're actually being connected with the death of Jesus and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to a brand new life they go 
dying person of sin into the water, living person resurrected to a new life coming out of the water. But water's all we've got. And what we need is the Holy Spirit. I can't do that. You can't do that. But Jesus does that. Don't point at each other. Don't point at yourself. Always point to Jesus. He's the only one that can take sin away. He's the only Lamb of God that takes away sin. And He's the only one that can give us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And He's the only one that can baptize us in that Spirit. The next day, verse um, 35 they need bigger letter numbers in my Bible. I have to put on the readers to see the number. And verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And he kind of reminds them. He said, Lamb of God. That guy right there. Lamb of God. Disciples heard this. They want to know where Jesus is going, where he's staying. They want to follow Jesus. They understand John is handing them off. That's an important concept we need to have. Our job as disciples of Jesus Christ is to point at the Lamb and hand them off. Send them to Jesus. Bring them to Jesus. They ask where he's staying and he says, come see. They spent the rest of the day with him. Verse 46. Excuse me, that's 40. I do need my readers badly, don't I? Well, you know, this is not a rock star preacher. This is a blind preacher. Andrew. Andrew's one of the disciples who was with John. He heard him say, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look in verse 41. What's the first thing Andrew does? Andrew says, I got a brother that doesn't know this. And he go grab Simon. And he tells Simon, we have found the Messiah. That's the Christ. That's the anointed one of God. If you're Jewish, you know that means that's the Savior. We found the Savior. And he brought him to Jesus. My job, your job. Do you know Jesus? Do you know He's the Savior? I got a better answer on the first question, so I'll ask that one again. Do you know He's the Savior? This is yes, this is no. If it's completely off base, just get up and leave, okay? You know He's the Savior. And you have friends that don't know Him. My job, your job. Is to find brothers and friends and workmates and bring them and say, This is the Savior. It happens again. You know, it gets repeated because we're supposed to catch it. In verse 43, the next day, they're leaving for leaving Galilee, and Jesus first finds Philip and says, Philip, follow me. I've heard of people being called by, by Jesus. They find a Bible somewhere and they read it and they just start serving him, letting him be Lord and follow him. It happens. Philip is called directly by Jesus. Verse 44, it tells that Philip is from the same town as Andrew and Simon or Peter. And so, verse 45, Philip found Nathaniel. We have found the one that Moses spoke about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. That's a good summary of the Old Testament if you're Jewish. We have the law, Moses, the first five books, and the rest of the books of the Old Testament, the prophets. It's shorthand for our Bible. It's the Bible, the Old Testament. Law and prophets have spoken about this one. We found him. He's confident. Jesus is the Savior. And he adds on to that, he's Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. 
Nazareth, you got to get the best disdain you can in your voice, okay? Well, the Old Testament said Jesus is supposed to be born in Bethlehem, which he is, but he grows up in Nazareth, and Nazareth is backwater town, really close to some Gentile areas, not highly thought of. No, nothing, in, nothing in the law and the prophets says you're supposed to get a Savior out of Nazareth, and so Nathaniel asked the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I'm trying to think of how that could be. I guess, I'm, pardon, we have guests from Oklahoma and my deepest apologies. <laughs> but it's like coming here and saying, we've got a Savior. He's from Oklahoma City. Give me a break. Can anything good come from Oklahoma? Except these two guests. Thank you for being here today. Oh, I warned them. I told them when I met them, you know, I'm going to say something terribly rude about Oklahoma. That's how they felt about Nazareth. And Philip just says, come see. You come check it out yourself. When he's coming toward Jesus and Nathaniel's approaching Jesus, listen to Jesus' words. Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. There's some wordplay there because Israel is Jacob. Jacob was a liar. Now we have a descendant of the liar who doesn't lie. Nathaniel doesn't understand. How do you know me? Midway through verse 48, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, I don't know what Nathaniel was doing under that fig tree. And I don't even know if it's a real fig tree. I have a suspicion Nathaniel may be sitting there daydreaming about the shade and the coolness. Or, or, or he definitely knows nobody knows I was under that fig tree. Maybe he's promising God or pleading with God to show him the Savior, to bring a Messiah for their world. But whatever it is, he knows nobody could possibly know about this. And Jesus kind of gives him a sign. Because he says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel declares, listen to this declaration. Rabbi, you are the son of God. Now he's way out in front of himself. John is going to tell us things that Jesus does, that Nathaniel's going to witness, that he's able to know for certain this is the Son of God. This is the Savior. This is my Creator. But he's already seeing it. A bit early, maybe. But he's willing to read the evidence and know who Jesus is. Philip had to do nothing but bring him. You have friends that need Jesus. You have workmates that need Jesus. And you may be thinking, well, I don't know how to talk to them about Jesus. Tell them what you know. I found a Savior. He's the Son of God. I'd like you to know Him. Be a real friend to your friends. Be real family to your family. And introduce them to the one who can take away their sin. And make them a child of God. And make them alive. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Look down to verse 51. Jesus is really glad. He says, you, you believe me because I said I saw you under the fig tree? Well, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God descending and ascending on the Son of Man. You remember Jacob? running from his brother Esau, 
And he, he lays down in Genesis in Bethel. It's not named Bethel yet, but he puts his head on a rock and he has a dream. And there's this ladder or stairway and angels are coming up and down. And he says, I found the house of God. So he names it Bethel, house of God. Jesus says, we got a new connection with heaven. We have a new connection for the ministry of heaven into people's lives, and that is Son of Man. That is Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we can't keep that to ourselves. God wants heaven to pour blessings into the lives of your friends your brothers and sisters and cousins, maybe your parents. It's not about us. It's about God pouring blessings into their life, about Him taking away their sin. It's about Him making them children of God. And we get to have a hand in it. And the hand is simply pointing at Jesus. It's as simple as saying, would you come with me? There's a Bible study at Cheddar's. Would you come with me? There's a ladies' group meeting at the building. Would you come with me? We got this crazy new preacher. Would you come hear him? And then all of us need to keep pointing at Jesus. Because it's not about us. We are going to disappoint people, but he will not. I want to offer an invitation. Here's what I want you to do to respond to it. Pick somebody in your life and invite them this week. Pick someone in your life and pray for them every day until you have the courage for those words to come out. Would you come with me? I found something very wonderful and special. Would you come see it? And then ask them, please come. Would you pray with me? God, we want to be your disciples. We want to follow you. We want our sin to be gone, and we want blessings to come down from heaven on us. Father, we are aware that being disciples of Jesus means we talk about Him and we point to Him. Father, right now today we plead that we would recognize the people in our lives that need Jesus. And we beg you, Father, put more people in our lives. Not for our glory or for the glory of this church, but for the glory of your Son. Let us point to Him. Let us be a body that invites friends and comes and meets others' friends and shares Jesus. Strengthen us to this and prick us when we ignore people who need to know Him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.